Good afternoon, traders and investors. Will back here with another one coming to you with a Tuesday market recap. Hope all of you had a very beautiful day of trading today. And in today's markets, guys, well, it's another little day of red. Most of the sectors in the S&P ending red over the course of the day, but we did have some slight pockets of strength in big tech, in healthcare a little bit, and in certain banks in financials as well. However, overall, guys, very, very, very mixed market actions as we prepare for another big week of earnings this week and also into next week as well. Speaking of earnings, I have a few things prepared for you guys in today's video. Number one, we're going to go over a few company earnings that came out today and one that came out unexpectedly. So we're going to be covering Enphase. We're also going to be covering Texas Instruments, one of the interesting semiconductor names. And then we're going to cover one that was not supposed to come out today at all. And that is Starbucks. Starbucks coming out with their earnings preemptively. They were supposed to report next Wednesday after the close, but coming out with their numbers right away because unfortunately their numbers were not very good. So kind of bracing the markets for impact. So we'll take a look at those three companies as earnings first off. And then we also have some news from McDonald's. McDonald's stocks unfortunately getting hit very hard in the after hours here. An E. coli outbreak affecting a number of different locations across the United States. And McDonald's in the after hour because of that drop was down at one point in time almost 10% when that news broke out shortly after the close. So there was a lot of action here in the after hours, guys. And I did trade that McDonald's trade, made a little bit of money already out of the position with some profits. So we'll do a quick little recap of that article as well. And thereafter, we're going to dive into our major technical analysis for our major stock market indexes, followed by our big tech names. And lastly, take a quick glimpse in my portfolio for a few new trades made today and how I remain positioned through the rest of the week. So a lot to cover in today's video, guys. Let's jump right into the action, shall we? So the SPY down about 0.05%, the QQQ's up a healthy 0.11%, but that is pretty much where the green stops. You can see the heat map right here, not a very good day in the market. However, we did have some good pockets of nice performance in uh, big tech, notably Microsoft, Google, and Meta kind of doing their best to hold it up. Semiconductors largely flat on the day, Nvidia not pushing up any further. Consumer defensives, Walmart and Costco, your bright points there. The banks did actually fairly good today. They were the bright point in the financial sector. And healthcare, a lot of your drug manufacturers were considerably up today. The healthcare insurance providers remain slightly weak after their earnings. And the bottom half of the market, guys, very, very, very mixed. All across the board today, extremely mixed performance. You can see that even better expressed on the one day relative. Consumer defensives, communication services, real estate, energy, and technology to the upside and to the downside, everything else led, unfortunately, by industrials. So very, very, very mixed market, guys. The bulls are trying their best to play defense at the all-time highs as we continue to see rotation, rotation, rotation. Now, a lot of your other major sectors, guys, were down today. Financials, healthcare, and a lot of other sectors too. But we did have some good performance in Microsoft, Google, Meta, and Amazon, which helped hold up the S&P, which is what you're looking for, right? When the rest of the market takes a break, you at least need the big tech names to play a little bit defense. And that's what they did today. So before we get into more technicals, guys, let us dive into uh, the McDonald's article first, and then we're going to get into our earnings, okay? So McDonald's shares fall after CDC says E. coli outbreak linked to quarter pounders. This news broke out right after the close. The outbreak has led to 10 hospitalizations and one death. Very unfortunate situation. 49 cases have been reported so far in 10 states with the most illnesses in Colorado and Nebraska. For the time being, it seems to be uh, more in the central United States, in the central portion of the country rather, not so much in the coast, but we will keep an eye on these further developments, guys. It's a breaking news article. They just came out with it. So we will keep an eye on how this continues to affect McDonald's share price in the short and medium term. Obviously, they need to do a lot of damage control and identify the culprit for the outbreak. Is it possibly um, the uh, food contamination source from the actual suppliers or is it something in McDonald's uh, own and it's in their own chains, right? Something like possibly uh, some negligence practices in terms of washing hands or stuff like that, right? I'd be surprised if it's location dependent like that. It seems to be coming from uh, the supplier side and they did pull a few items off of the menu, namely the chopped onion. So they took that off the menu at first and they've also pulled the quarter pounder from uh, a lot of their locations that are currently affected. So we'll keep a close eye on this news, guys. But when I saw this news outbreak, my first, 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 uh, intuition was 
just to understand where we were in the grand scheme of the chart on McDonald's. We know they have a beautiful monthly uptrend right now. And if we were to retest into the lower uh, 280s, 270s, guys, I was very interested in buying this stock regardless of what the negative news catalyst would have been to bring us down in there. And that's exactly what we did. In the after hours after this news candle, the RSI down here was crushed to an eight, almost a seven, guys. That is extremely, extremely low RSI. So undoubtedly, we are expecting a bounce. So I played the lows right here, trying to get into the position. I would not have minded, guys, playing this one with a little bit more duration, accumulating more positions closer to the 200-day moving average at the 280, and even coming a little bit lower into the 270s. I would not have been opposed to holding the position a little bit, building a little bit of position in this juicy area right here, and then going for the upside continuation. But I chose to just swing trade it in the after hours. The orders are right here. I went small with it, just considering the fact that that if we would have kept dropping into tomorrow morning and we would have had no recovery in the after hours, I probably just would have kept it and averaged into the position a little bit more because I really like that level on McDonald's. So here you see here, $285 was the buy-in for about seven shares, just about $2,000 in exposure. And then we sold them literally about 15, 20 minutes ago before making the video at 296. So about 4.2% in ROI, roughly about $90 worth of profits. Not too bad for a very quick after hours trades on not that much exposure at all. So very happy with the way that trade went out, but I will keep an eye on this tomorrow, guys. And if I find any better options plays, if we continue dropping, I definitely will always let you guys know. So that's pretty much it for the McDonald's news article. We'll take this one day at a time, of course. Um, now let's move into our earnings cycle, shall we? So in terms of earnings, guys, we're going to start off with the one that should not have even been here in the first place, which is Starbucks. So Starbucks coming out with a preliminary earnings result after the close. They gave us a lot of numbers, but they didn't give us the exactly full picture with all of the financial statements, right? But they definitely set the tone for what we might be uh, expecting coming into next week as well. So you can see here the massive drop that Starbucks had after their earnings, about 9% to the downside. Nobody was expecting it and the earnings were not very good. Now, keep in mind, we know that the earnings for Starbucks have not been good over the past three weeks, or three quarters, rather, and they even brought in a new CEO, the former CEO of Chipotle, Brian Nickel, one of the best CEOs for quick service restaurant um, functions. So we'll see in terms of next Wednesday as well, when he gives the earnings call, we will get a much more detailed plan as to how he attempts to solve all of the all of the problems plaguing Starbucks right now, and we'll get into them. So EPS missed by 22%, not very good, and a revenue missed by about 3% as well. Starbucks, this has been the this has pretty much been the um, you know, the standard for Starbucks over the last three quarters, right? Big misses, and even though they're they're reducing guidance every single quarter, they can't even meet the reduced guidance. The numbers come in even worse and even worse and even worse. So let's get into the article, shall we? Starbucks shares slide after coffee chain says sales fell again and they suspended their guidance for 2025. So suspending the guidance company's same store sales slid for the third consecutive quarter fueled by a 10% tumble in traffic to its North American stores. That is a very steep number, guys. Starbucks also raised its quarterly dividend to provide some certainty to investors as it tries to turn around the business. So that quarterly dividend, that announcement for the quarterly dividend is the one major saving grace. When that news came out, that is what really caused the stock to rally a little bit from the lows. It goes to show that the company is committed to providing returns to its shareholders and putting the shareholders front and center. Now let's move on. Our fourth quarter performance makes it clear that we need to fundamentally change our strategy so we can get back to growth. And that's exactly what we we're doing with our back to Starbucks plan, said the new CEO, Brian Nickel. We believe that our problems are very fixable and that we have significant strengths to build on, he continued. The company's preliminary net, preliminary net sales fell 3% to $9.1 billion, and they reported preliminary... Plural, why do I have so much problems with that word? Preliminary adjusted earnings uh, of about 80 cents, which was the 20% miss on EPS. Not a good number. Analysts were expecting 1.03 in EPS and 9.38 in revenue, so they missed on both marks there. Slumping sales. This is a big one, guys. The quarter's 7% decline in same-store sales was the company's steepest drop since the pandemic. The expectation from analysts was for about 3 3.5%. So they literally dropped double the expected amount in same-store sales declines. The company blamed its soft sales on weaker demand in North America. In its home market, its same-store sales decreased 6%. 
Traffic tumbled 10% despite increased investments in the business, like more frequent promotions in its mobile app and an expanded range of product offerings. What do we know when we read that sentence, guys? Increased promotions, increased investments in the business, lower revenue and lower traffic. That means that Starbucks is spending more money and getting less money in return, AKA their margins are starting to get squeezed. And Starbucks has decent margins to begin with, but they don't have that much wiggle room. In China, its second largest market, same store sales plummeted 14%. The estimate was for 10%. The company attributed the decline to competition in the country, which it said is altering consumer behavior and changing the company's strategy for the market. A challenge for nickel, that is definitely an understatement. In the US, the chain has been losing its occasional customers who have opted to save money instead of spending on its macchiatos and refreshers. Starbucks's business in China has also been struggling to recover ever since the pandemic, and the rise of cheaper local rivals like Luckin Coffee and a more cautious consumer have dented sales in recent months. So definitely not the best article at all, guys. And here we go. This is from the company directly, right? Despite our heightened investments, we were unable to change the trajectory of our traffic decline, resulting in pressures in both our top and bottom line. While our efficiency efforts continued to produce according to plan, they were not enough to outpace the impact of the decline in traffic. We want to amplify our confidence in the business and provide some certainty as we drive our turnaround. For that reason, we have increased our dividend. So the increase in dividend is basically telling shareholders Please, please stay with us. We promise we're turning the business around. So not the best look for Starbucks at all, guys. Let's look into uh, a little bit of the valuation real quick at the uh, current share price, right? So Q3 October earnings right now, as you can see, guys, they're not good, right? Continuing sales traffic decline three quarters in a row. They had the large expansion in China during COVID, and now that is struggling. Talk about a um, um, a mistimed expansion into China, right? They got hit by the pandemic. And then after the pandemic, China went to, into a recession. So it's very tough to sell $5 cups of coffee to people in China when they're in the midst of a global or of, a, of a Chinese recession right now. The economy is definitely struggling. And the cheaper rivals like Luck and Coffee are pretty much just eating their lunch at this point. So Starbucks has a lot on its plate for the foreseeable future. I cannot wait to hear how Brian Nickel uh, is going to choose to address all of these problems, not only for the North American market, but also for the Chinese market as well. Now, pricing power is crushed. As we saw, they're forced to reduce prices, increase promotions, getting squeezed in the margins. And we saw that uh, from what the CFO was saying in that earnings release. Margins are at risk and an 8% EPS loss year over year. That leaves them with revenue growth, guys. And I cut back these numbers because the estimate numbers are a little bit higher, but I'm cutting them back. Revenue growth, 6% per year, slightly ambitious, especially through next year as well. EPS growth of 10% per year. The consensus is 12%. I have slashed it to 10%, just taking the uh, bear case scenario at this point, right? Now, for their forward PE at $94, PE ratio of 28.5. So even at a lower pr share price right now, 92, 93, $94, they're still not that good of a deal. Look at the PEG ratio, guys. $94, when you divide this by their EPS growth rate, the PEG is 2.84. That is very, very high. And you might say, well, Will, the EPS is low. Shouldn't we look at the free cash flow yield? You would be absolutely right. But when we look at the free cash flow yield, guys, it is only 2.5%. We would like to see closer to 4 or 5% to at least um, be able to tell ourselves, okay, well, maybe I'll be sitting in this company for a while, but at least I'm getting a decent free cash flow yield of 4 to 5% per year, which is roughly the treasury build yield right now. Um, you know, obviously Starbucks has risk, right? But you at least would want a company that's struggling right now to offer you some yield. This is dividends and uh, share buybacks, of course, right? For the most part, you would like to offer them at least above the risk-free rate at the at the government Fed, right? For T-bills, for one, two-year T-bills, but that is not the case. So on every single metric, guys, Starbucks, unfortunately for the company, remains expensive. So in terms of where I would possibly, um, you know, entertain opening a position here for a little bit of a swing trade, guys, I need to see in the 80s, right? If, if we were to open up negative tomorrow in the low 80s, I might be tempted to just wait and wait possibly for a bit more of this gap fill. 85, I really can't buy this company, guys. Much before 85, all the way down to 75 is my desired target range. I played the company a little bit in the past, sold the shares, um, you know, pretty much almost for break even. It wasn't moving. And then we got the Brian Nickel news right there, right? So that was kind of an unforeseen event. 
I wouldn't really be tempted to buy this company just because of the valuation and the fact that they suspended their guidance. So the turnaround story is going to take a lot, a lot longer than people are expecting at this point. So guys, if I'm to invest in this company, I really need a good price. I am not feeling any FOMO up here at all. If we revisit, revisit the lower 80s to mid 70s over the next two quarters, I could be tempted to start a position, but really not much before that, guys. The fundamentals are a little bit rich and the company does have a ton of problems that it has to deal with. So I'm not touching this one un until I get to hear from the man himself next Wednesday after the close, Mr. Brian Nichols to tell us how he plans to turn around these various aspects of the business. So that's pretty much everything for our Starbucks earnings. Hopefully you appreciated that. Now let's jump into earnings number two, which we were expecting, which is Enphase. So Enphase down 12% in the after hours right now, which is literally the expected move. And this is why I did not play this one you might remember the past couple of quarters, I was showing you guys how to play earnings in a safe way, uh, but I haven't been doing that this earnings cycle because I'm expecting some nasty surprises pretty much across the board. End phase, 12% to the downside. It was the expected move. And although the company's guidance on the earnings call was fairly good into 2025, this quarter showed that the company is still kind of in its cyclical bottoming out process, right? They are making a road to recovery, but kind of like Starbucks, two different companies, two different industries. This one as well, the recovery story will take some time. However, the valuation on this one is getting very interesting. So let's get into it, right? So into the numbers real quick, EPS miss by almost 17%, an unfortunate revenue miss as well by about 3%. So missing on the top and bottom lines, let's get into some, uh, a little bit of the no more numbers, right? So missed on the revenue estimate by about 3.3%. They did do a good job for their net margins. And this is what I'll focus on, guys, in this earnings for Enphase specifically, because we know the revenues have been declining. The demand has been declining. Interest rates are high right now. So there's not a tremendous amount of, of um, demand for their products. We also know that they had a big problem uh, with their wholesalers, the people that they ship their products to for them for, for then the products to be distributed, um, because there was not that much demand, there was a buildup in inventory since 2023, and they've been trying to get through that inventory, and now they actually have been getting through that inventory fairly decently. You can see here, they beat the free cash flow estimate by 47%, and inventory is down 26% year to date. These are the bright points, but that is kind of pretty much where it stops. The next quarter guide, they missed on the revenue guide for next quarter by about 12.7%, and they did miss ever so slightly here on their net margins or their uh, gap gross profit margins and EBITDA margins as well. So unfortunate misses for end phase all across the board, guys. For the most part, missed on this current quarter and missed on the expectation for next quarter as well. But there are there is a light at the end of the tunnel for this company. So let's get into it, okay? So I want to just show you guys one thing. End phase, they've been able, this is end phase's energy profit margins um, for you know, the past roughly 10 years at this point. Gross profit, gross, gross profit margins have been maintained fairly good, but you see the problem here, the operating margins are getting crushed, right? Because there's only so many expenses that you can do away with when you're operating this style of company, right? They try and try and try to keep costs low as best as they can, but there's only so much you can do. At the end of the, at the, end of the day, you're going to have a portion of costs that are fixed costs. No matter how much revenue you make, those costs are going to be fixed. And then you have variable costs that expand. When revenue expands, this is cost of goods sold, right? And when revenue comes down, the, those, um, f those variable expenses come down as well. And now we're pretty much crunched to the most cost efficiency that Enphase can do while generate, generating relatively low amounts of revenue. That's why you see the operating margins are getting squeezed right now. And the net profit margins were getting squeezed for the last three, four quarters as well. But, 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 but. It's now starting to turn around here, guys. Take a look at this. I've derived the net profit margins for the quarter. They are at 12%. So that's very good. If you want a more visual representation of this, you can see the declines in revenue right here. And the little um, pale blue line right here is your net margins. You can see struggling to maintain positive. Last quarter was about 3.5%. And now happy to say, guys, that they have a 12% quarter on their hands. So very good, right? We're kind of trying to round the corner away from the bottom. So that is quite good. Total revenue for the third quarter was 380 million compared to the 303 million in the second quarter. So you can see right here, they're getting better, right? After several quarters of declining and declining and declining revenue, they finally posted a sequential beat. A lot better than the Q2 quarter, of course. 
Now, our revenue in the United States for the third quarter of 2024 increased approximately 43% with the second quarter, which is what we were seeing right here. The increase was due to higher shipments to distributors as inventory returned to normal levels. Our revenue in Europe decreased approximately 15% for the third quarter of 2024 compared with Q2. The decline in revenue was the result of further softening in European demand. So there it is, guys, right? The demand is still not coming back on all fronts. The US is starting to round the corner, but Europe is still a little bit behind uh, in that kind of, in, in the um, cyclical, in the cyclicality, right? It's a very, very cyclical business, this one. It's highly dependent on uh, interest rates as a whole. But I like Enphase, guys. I like what Enphase is trying to do with its products. If you don't know really what they do, um, they have micro inverters essentially, right? So when you collect power, they do not sell solar panels. They sell the this tiny little thing for each solar panel. It's called a microinverter. Essentially what it does is it converts the solar power that you're receiving on the panels into actual usable electricity in a very efficient manner. But they've been branching out. The company only started doing these microinverters but now they have tons and tons of tons of different applications. So here's the microinverter, but they now also have, um, you know, balcony solar systems as well that they can help install, which is very, very popular in Europe where people uh, don't necessarily have single family homes for the most part, right? Especially in very dense European uh, capital cities. So this is very, very interesting for them. They also have an IQ battery, which is also similar to uh, Tesla's power wall, something that you just put in your garage it stores a bunch of a bunch of energy. And then when you need it, when you don't want to be plugged into the grid or when you have a power outage, you can use the power in here. So very nice product. They also have an IQ EV charger, uh, you know, and energy management systems as well. They have a very nice app as well, which allows you to, um, which is also run with AI, which tells you the optimal periods, whether or not you can uh, just, um, offload your own power to the grid and get some credits, uh, or whether you, it's a good time for you to, uh, you know, pull power from the grid. So very, very nice app here. Obviously I'm going through these super, super quickly guys, right? We can spend like 20 minutes on describing what Enphase does as a business. But the one thing I wanted to um, focus on here is they want, they want to increase the share of wallet per home. You can see in 2019, only micro inverters, $2,000 end phase potential per home was the general consensus. Now with all of their other products, they're up to roughly, well, 2022 onwards, they can go and get, if you take all of their services, about $12,000 per person. So they are expanding their product base. The company is growing, but just as I was saying, guys, it's a bit of a cyclical business. Everybody knows that right now. We're just kind of waiting for the turnaround phase. But right now, guys, at these lower levels, I'm getting really, really, really interested in end phase. Let's go over some of the numbers right here. So we can obviously see declining revenue was a little bit of a problem for them for a while. No secret there. They had a big boom during the pandemic and after. And now we have a little bit of a decline into 2024. Inventory issues, high interest rates, low demand, et cetera, et cetera. And then 2025, per the earnings call that I listened into briefly, per the management team, they were supposed to resume kind of business to normal in the second half of 2025. And the revenue curve shows that as well, right? We have the declines right here, and now we're slowly gonna start to be resuming into that growth. So now, arguably, at the lowest possible sentiment of the business, interest rates are still somewhat high. Now is probably the time to strike if you are a fan of this business at these lowered valuations while the business is kind of rounding the corner. Can it fall a little bit more and drop even more? Yes, possibly. But are we closer to the bottom um, than otherwise? Yes, probably as well, right? So obviously very, very tough to pick the exact bottom, guys. But the moral of the story is, are we rounding the corner? And in my opinion, the answer is yes. So take a look here. Revenue growth, still very healthy, 15% per year, 2025 onwards. EPS growth, 22%, 2025 onwards. Very healthy numbers coming into next year. So let's use the 2025 numbers as a matter of fact, since that'll be the return to growth, because 2024, we're on a decline on EPS. So we get a peg of about 1.59, which on its own, it's not that bad when we only look at when we include the 2024 numbers. But let's say we're into 2025 already, at $84 where we are, the PE ratio gets cut in half, guys, because look at this EPS expansion from this year to next year. It's quite significant, and then it's kind of a normalized increase of about 22%, right? So 2024 is a little bit of an outlier. That's why I'm going with 2025 onwards. Now, PE ratio, 18. And we when you divide this by their uh, EPS growth rate, we get a PEG ratio of 0.81 decently under one guys this is pretty fantastic for the company which is why i say 
I'm getting really interested in playing end phase guys tomorrow and do not be surprised if I show you guys possibly some short put orders that I'll probably put into the market tomorrow. Uh, I'll probably be targeting the mid 70 range, the lows that we hit last November, probably mid 70 range, but anywhere in the mid 70 range, acquiring some shares really wouldn't be opposed. 75 all the way down to roughly $60, $60 of the absolute crush level, right? And I will be DCAing into this one, but at a first glance tomorrow, I probably will be writing some short puts probably with a little bit of time on them as well, most likely around the $75, $74 area because I'm really starting to like this valuation. So that's pretty much everything we have for Enphase today. Now let's move into the last one, and that is going to be Texas Instruments, a little bit of a semiconductor play. So Texas Instruments um, up in the after hours about 4%. Now this is a, a I wouldn't say it's a, a crucial part of the semiconductor infrastructure business, but it does give us a good uh, insight into a few of the industries that have kind of been left behind namely PCs and peripherals, and also namely the automobile industry, because TXM is a heavy manufacturer for both of those industries. Take a look here. Um, we'll just bring up the Oops, that's the wrong window. We'll just bring in the uh, earnings slides real quick. So if you can see TXN right here, so the revenue by segment, you can see they do a couple of different things, right? They have a growing infra energy infrastructure business. For the most part though, they do factory automation, motor drives, robotics, right? That is most of the revenue where they generate it from. Energy is a nice up and coming business as they provide uh, panels, inverters, and storage Well, they provide chips for all of these things as well. Now also they provide a decent amount of stuff for the automobile industry, kind of like another one of their sector peers, ON Semiconductor, which you guys see me play often on the channel, who are also up about four or 5% in the after hours after uh, TXN's earnings. And they also do advanced driver assist uh, systems, right? Think of camera sensors, lane assist sensors, and X, Y, Z different things across that. So you have an industrial application down here, and of course the automotive application there as well. What they don't show right here is they do have a decent little amount of business in their PC and peripherals market. So, but you can see that all all of their segments should be growing at roughly a 7% compound annual growth rate, which is good. And by end market as well, about a 13 to 10, or sorry, 10 moving onwards, about a decent amount of uh, ramp going forward, right? So they are growing very nicely. We don't have the estimates yet for 2026 and stuff like that. This is a report that I pulled from their August uh, shareholder meeting, essentially, prior to their earnings. But all in all, I just wanted to present you the business a little bit, just so you get some context, right? So problems for the company before we get into the article just want to give some context the problems that the company was facing kind of a bit like end phase right completely different stock in a completely different sector but the auto industry the energy industry especially solar and what they do and pc and peripherals have been down and you've heard that from every single company that operates in those segments right take a look right here we can even see that expressed visually you can see that from the heights of the booms of the post pandemic, we are now coming into weak seasonality, right? Everybody got their stuff that they wanted to, their phones, their tablets, their PCs, their cars, their everything back here. The companies also got all the industrial production equipment that they needed because rates were cheap. And so now we fall into a bit of weak seasonality, but it should be picking up with the rest of these markets. We've been hearing this from everybody all across the board, right? We just heard it from Enphase 2025, should be the resumption of cyclical growth. TXN said this as well on the earnings call as well, are expecting earnings growth to come back in Q1 of 2025. And we've heard it from other players as well uh, in various different industries, especially the more cyclical uh, natured ones, right? So there's your crush in EPS, there's your crush in revenue off the 2022 highs as well, and should be resuming into 2025. So this is another company where we were looking for are they starting to round the curve back to growth? And the answer is yes. So same problems. There was an inventory buildup. They've gone through that inventory and now they're going to try to get back to a little bit of growth right here. So Texas Instruments earnings show some improvements despite weak industrial sales, as we were kind of talking about, right? Texas Instruments earnings reflected continued pressures in industrial semiconductors, though overall revenue improved on a sequential basis. So they're getting better quarter over quarter, right? They posted 14, uh, 4.15 billion in revenue for the third quarter, down 8% from a year ago, but up 9% from the prior quarter. Same thing as end phase, right? So moving on, they saw sequential declines in its industrial business, but sequential growth in its other end markets. Some of the company's end markets include automotive, personal electronics, and communications equipment. So everything except for industrial guys 
is rounding the corner, right? So Texas Instruments' fourth quarter forecast for earnings per share calls for 107 to 129, while the analyst had been modeling 134. So they did have a fairly significant miss on EPS right here, guys, right? This is a decent miss on EPS uh, by roughly 20%, right? I mean, at the midpoint, it's more like 10% uh, type of thing, but at the lower end of the range, that would be roughly a 20% miss. Not the best, and they did give a, light, a little bit of a miss on revenue here expectation as well. If we use the midpoint, that as well is down by about 5% against the guidance. But this stock is up because the market was expecting it to be a little bit worse than it was. But now that Texas Instruments is showing us that it's on a recovery story, but maybe it's not going to be until Q1 of 2025, the market is actually rewarding them for that. The company had free cash flow of $416 million in the quarter, contributing to a $1.47 billion on a 12-month trailing basis. Now, Texas Instruments has never been a company that's renowned for its massive amounts of free cash flow, but they do have decent free cash flow, especially in the prior years, and now they're kind of getting back to the basics. You see the free cash flow has been crushed. 2023 and all throughout so far 2024, free cash flow has been crushed, so now the metrics are not so good, but we do expect them to improve in the future. Take a look right here. One thing that they used to do with their free cash flow is do a ton of buybacks, right? Ton and ton and ton of buybacks. But you guys can see when that free cash flow started disappearing, I'll pull up the chart again, when the free cash flow started dwindling and disappearing over the course of this year, well, obviously they cannot do as many buybacks, right? So that is why this chart is kind of flatlining right now. But usually when they are in a bullish environment, they do do a lot of buybacks, which helps bolster the EPS. In terms of their profit margins, we can also see right here, they have been sequentially declining from the peaks in 2022. Two, but similar to end phase, they are now rounding the corner back to ramping up. But still, I mean, this company, guys, even though they've been on the decline, look, I mean, their net margins are still close to 30%, which is amazing for a company that manufactures products. Usually you only see 30% uh, margins in companies that do software as a service, not so much um, equipment manufacturers or product manufacturers, right? Probably them and TSMC have some of the best margins in um, uh, in the game right now in terms of uh, raw semiconductor equipment and stuff like that, right? So that's just a quick overview of Texas Instruments and what's kind of plaguing them or has been plaguing them right now. In terms of their uh, valuation, guys, revenue growth, 9.6% per year, very good. 24% EPS expansion. We'll use 2025 onwards for the same reasons as end phase, right? Because they're on a decline into 2024. So we want to know from now forward, are they doing good? And the answer is yes, 24% year over year gives them at $200 per share, a 31.8 PE. At first glance, seems a little bit high, but when you divide that by their fantastic EPS growth rate, we get a peg ratio of 1.32, which is decent. It's not crazy cheap, but it's also nowhere close to being expensive. I would say that it's fairly decent, and the technicals do present a little bit of a trade opportunity as well. I wouldn't be opposed to doing this one, guys. This is one of my favorite patterns, right? The monthly breakout retest of a prior huge range of resistance, guys. This is literally two, almost three years worth of resistance. We're now above it, back testing it as support and could be a potential due for a little bit further rally when semiconductors come back into bullish favor because we know as of lately, it's only really been AVGO, TSMC and NVIDIA. Everybody else is doing a whole lot of nothing, right? Everybody else is, is not only doing nothing, but is actually getting hit pretty badly in terms of share prices as of lately, right? So I wouldn't be opposed to taking a trade here, guys. That's 195 down to about 185 for the casual monthly breakout retest and possibly run. So I'd be looking at this zone down here, possibly for some short puts or maybe even some shares, some call debit spreads, whatever your preferred uh, preferred financial instrument is at that point. But I do see a swing trade here uh, for the possible recapture of these levels, as I said, into next quarter and Q1 of 2025 as well. So that's pretty much everything we had for our earnings today, guys. I tried to go through, through them as quickly as possible, but you know me, I like to talk a little bit much, but I think it provides good value, right? When I just don't give... I could very easily take over, take care of these earnings guys in two minutes. Just tell you guys the revenue, tell you guys the EPS, give you the valuation, give you the technical level, and that's it, right? But I figure that guy by giving you guys a little bit more context, a little bit more insight into how I look at these things, you see, like, you don't need to spend half an hour, an hour going through the financial statements, going through 5,000 different ratios, right? As long as you get a good sense of where the business is heading, do they have manageable levels of debt? How is their free cash flow? How are their profit margins? And how is the outlook of the business? You should get a fairly good idea of where they stand in relation to how they've done in the past and how they stand to do in the future, right? So 
That's just the fact of the matter. I mean, I can do, I could spend hours on an Excel sheet, guys, as well as all the other analysts. But to be honest with you, does it give us that much of an edge? Not really, right? To be honest with you, not, not, not really. No, not more than that. So moving on to uh, the S&P, let's move on to our technical analysis, guys. So spy down about 0.05% for, let me get a quick sip of coffee because that was a lot of information. So thank you guys for bearing with me. So moving on to SPY right now, fairly decent chart, but nothing much has changed. I tell you guys to focus on this level right here, 579 guys. We're in a very nice daily uptrend for the SPY right now. Higher lows are set, but we know that they failed the breakout. So now they have a second attempt at, co at confirming that breakup, playing good defense of the 12 EMA, which is our short-term guide. But if we lose 579 in the next few days, daily uptrend is lost. Daily downturn is underway and we start our infamous weekly consolidation that we've been looking for on the channel for a couple weeks in a row. Six weeks of up, of up is good, but it cannot last forever, guys. So if you see the break of 579, the next stop is these guys right here at roughly the 575 level and a bit lower than that. If we really come off and have two, three weeks of consolidation, target your overall level of support, guys. 565 down to 560 is a lot bigger level. You also have the 12 EMA right there. Just a would be for a healthy weekly higher low for possible further trend continuation. So as of right now, guys, no red flags for the bulls just yet. Moving on to the Qs, Qs also doing a whole lot of nothing. So we know the context is we are still in a nice daily uptrend. The higher lows are set with this guy right here, but no new highs at the current time. So keep a close watch over the next few days. Obviously, if you break out of the highs, no harm, no foul, daily uptrend simply continues, and at that point, your resistance is the all-time highs. In the event, however, we flush 487.69, daily downtrend is underway, and then you look out to the weekly and just understand that we're just looking for a weekly higher low for possible further trend continuation. The big level of support down there, 482 down to roughly 475 is going to be the mark, and the 12 EMA is sitting there on the weekly as well. So the bulls looking fairly good, no major red flags as of yet. On to financials right now. Financials down about 0.19%, but today was fairly mixed, right? The credit cards were down, the banks were up, and Berkshire was down, which is a big weight in financial as well. So very, very mixed day for financials, but nice to see them play some good defense here at the 12 EMA. We know who's in control here, guys. The bulls, right? Very nice daily trend expansion, looking for the daily higher low for the possible daily trend continuation. They did not get the hourly time frame back. You only know the daily higher low is set when you get the resumption of the hourly uptrend. This is a nice hourly bounce, but it is not a confirmed hourly uptrend just yet. So in the event that they roll this one over into tomorrow, we are still looking for a higher low, anything about 45, looking for that daily higher low for further trend continuation. But the problem arises if we take back too much of this move, you lose all the momentum, you open up the door for the lower high into lower low daily downtrend flush. And at that point, you might be nervous. But once again, rely on the higher time frames. Who's in control here? The weekly bulls are in full control right now of this chart. As a matter of fact, anything above 44.58 is just looking for a weekly higher low for further trend continuation. The area of confluence, in my opinion, going to be 45.87. All of this previous resistance should be newfound support, and the 12 EMA is curling right up into that zone as well. Moving into the XLV healthcare division right now, down about 0.15%. And healthcare is coming on to its last line of defense right now, guys. 151 down to about 150. The Bulls trying to play defense, but the Bears are not making it easy for them, right? So the context, we had the daily downtrend going. We had the nice engulfing move. We were looking for the Bulls to set up for the higher low into higher high, reversal of the daily downtrend into daily uptrend, but that did not happen. The Bears said no and flushed into a new daily downtrend. So at this point in time, weekly downtrend is still in favor of the bears right now. And the next area that I would be targeting in the event we flush this support zone, well, we have to look a bit lower, guys. 147, 146 is a big level of defense. That will just be looking for the monthly higher low for further trend continuation. You can see that even if we lose this and then we come all the way down here on the weekly, guys, and even crack this level a little bit, looks a little bit shady, right? But no, the bulls have a ton of space, guys. Anything above 138 on the monthly is just looking for a higher low, on the monthly for further trend continuation in healthcare. My favorite two plays, three plays actually, because one's having earnings in the next few days. Um, the, my favorite one is UNH. If we pull back again, 550, 525, glorious breakout, retest, and possibly run. Another one that's doing the exact same pattern, I call it the breakout retest, but all this is is a trend continuation pattern, guys. We wait for the retest and then run. Another one is AbbVie, monthly chart, looking good. Breakout, retest of the previous highs, 12 EMA on the monthly is going to be curling up there as well. 
could be a nice little location, guys. So keep your eyes peeled for Abvi down here, 182 to 180. That is one of my favorite stocks in the entire healthcare sector. And the other one, another one of my favorite stocks in the entire healthcare sector is Thermo Fisher Scientific TMO, putting in a three-year range of accumulation while improving its fundamentals at the same time. So looking at the prior chart, guys, which way do you guys think this one will break in the event the healthcare sector hits the monthly higher low for further continuation? Which way do you guys think this one is going to break? Bullish or bearish? I don't know. You guys tell me, right? So that's everything for healthcare sector. So moving on to SMH. SMH not looking too bad, down about 0.45%, but still kind of hesitating. We know we're in this area of resistance. This red box right here, which is 260 down about 251. Not looking too bad, but also not looking the greatest, right? So we know the context is a nice daily uptrend. The daily higher lows are set. And now we're kind of trapped in the middle, right? So we need to wait for the bulls to break. They still can get a new daily uptrend going and break through this area. However, in the event we break below 245.50, daily downtrend is underway. And then you guys know the drill. Daily downtrend equals weekly consolidation. At this point, the bulls have tons of space. Anything above 213, looking for a weekly higher low for further trend continuation. I would be targeting, if we do break down, guys, 238 down about 230 could be a very, very, very nice area to write some short puts and look at the weekly MACD. So one, two little weeks more and continuously hover around the crossing area and set the higher lows and rise. You guys know what's going to happen to that MACD probably on for a third big leg to the upside coming in to Q4 in November and December, also known as the most bullish period for the markets. But we will see a lot of bearish catalysts can potentially happen. Recessionary factors, something at the Fed, stuff like that, right? So election uncertainty, geopolitical concerns, there's a long list, right? So we're not out of the woods just yet, but semis not looking too bad. My preferred way of playing this is going through my individual preferred names in semiconductors and writing some short puts below the market and benefiting from that volatility. Moving on to IWM Russell. So the Russell down again today, but we know the context. The bulls do have a little bit more space right now, trying to set the daily higher low, right? We're trying to go for the daily trend change. Now, the bulls have got have given back a decent amount of territory, but I wouldn't say it's unrecoverable, right? Anything above 215, looking for the daily higher low for a second, or depending how you look at this, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth attempt at this massive resistance area, guys. 2020 and 2021 highs. So not looking the worst, the weekly is still forming, uh, you know, a nice weekly uptrend as of right now, looking for the weekly higher low, anything above that same 214 level should just be a weekly higher low for a possible, you know, one, let's call it two, three, four, five different attempts, right? At this one, very challenging area. We will see if the bulls can do it or if they lose the weekly guys, if we flush these weekly lows, unfortunately, in my opinion, we are heading back into the 213. 208, and this is where I would personally be, inter personally be interested in starting a little bit of a position. Moving into the Dow Jones right now, Dow Jones down about 0.02%. Not much action here on the Dow Jones, but we know the context is a very nice daily uptrend as of currently. Higher lows are set, looking for the expansion, but we double topped and did not get it. So if we lose this area right here, 42,700, let's call it this line, well, you flush the daily higher lows you would then set up for the daily downtrend and you would be into weekly consolidation. Yes, absolutely, guys. So looking for the weekly higher lows if we do break down on that daily chart. And at that point, guys, I'd be targeting these guys right here, 41,900 uh, for the touch of the 12 EMA. You can see that they've been defending the 12 EMA fairly well, the Dow Jones, over the course of this year so far, right? So looking for that to be our first line of defense. And if things get really bad in the market over the next few weeks, well, I could possibly see a retest of 41.5 down about 41,000. But the bulls on the weekly, tons of space. Anything about 40K, guys, all the way down here, still just looking for a weekly higher low for further trend continuation. So that's everything for our major market indexes. Now, uh, we covered a lot of yields yesterday. If you haven't seen my video, I'm not going to go through them today, but I did about an, a six to seven minute segment on yields in yesterday's video. So check that out yesterday uh, if you want to get an updated view on my um, positions on yields and what I think about the most recent rally. We'll go over those once every two days or if there's a significant move. Uh, and for now, for the sake of saving time, I'm going to go through Apple real quick. So Apple down about 0.26%, but Apple's not looking the worst here, guys. Where are we consolidating? We're consolidating above our range of resistance, right? This 232 down about 228.50. They're doing a very nice attempt here at, you know, if we were to just smooth this one out a little bit, we're trying to go for the breakout retest and possibly run beyond the all-time highs. So Apple not looking too bad right now. I would be a bit concerned if we were to uh, give this entire move back 
and come below here and close below the 228, then we would get a little bit concerned that the bulls are already looking a little bit weak, a little bit tired and going for that weekly consolidation. Anything pretty much above 220, just gonna be looking for a weekly higher low for further trend continuation at that point. But Apple, not so many days before their earnings, guys. Earnings next Thursday. So about what, five, six trading days, seven trading days uh, before their six, uh, before their earnings next week. So not that much in terms of price action. Could it be another situation like Netflix, where Netflix ran very nicely prior to their earnings the week before, and then the few short days prior to their earnings, they had a decline? Well, we'll keep an eye on that for Apple, but definitely the next level of resistance is all the way at 237. So personally, I'm not really looking to make any swing trades on Apple prior to their earnings. I'll wait for earnings and then position myself thereafter. Now, moving on to AMD, which also has earnings next Tuesday. Big week next week for earnings, guys. Huge week. Almost every single person in this list of MAG7, except for uh, Netflix, NVIDIA, and Tesla, have their earnings next week, right? So, on to AMD. Unfortunately, AMD, guys, breaking down. Continuation of the daily downtrend. Tagging the 200-day moving average down here, though, at about 152. And they didn't quite close below it, as you can see, but we are on the verge of losing a very important level, guys. 162 down about 155. This hotly contested area for a majority of the year, we are about to lose it, almost about to lose the 200 daily moving average. So at this point, guys, right, we had a nice daily uptrend, and then unfortunately the bulls just could not continue. They got the daily downtrend, and now the bears are just following through. So once again, on AMD, keep an eye on the weekly, as long as we're in this daily downtrend. How do you know the daily downtrend is finished, guys? Well, we eventually need to see an engulfing move reset into the higher high, higher low pattern, right? So far, no sign of that just yet. Still looking out for it though, because the bulls control the weekly. So nice weekly uptrend right now, looking for the weekly higher low for possible further trend continuation. At this point, anything above 131 is still just looking for a weekly higher low. So not that bad guys, a te temporary little level down here is about the 150. The 50 week EMA, the 150 acted as a little bit of defense here as well. So we do still have a last line, but if the bulls give back too much, guys, they will lose all the momentum and we may, we may just be stuck between this level and this level for the foreseeable future. But then again, they do have earnings next Tuesday, not that many trading sessions uh, for AMD, right? And usually AMD moves about 7, 8% uh, after their earnings. So if they maintain here, you know, 8% down would just put us into the next area of support below us, 140, 135. And above would give us the weekly trend breakout that we've kind of been looking for. So very tough to predict the way that earnings is going to break but it should be a big one. We'll take this one one day at a time. Moving on to Amazon right now. Amazon up about 0.33%, not looking the worst, but still struggling here, trying to break out of this whole 188 to about 190 range. Big range for Amazon, right? It's been challenging for the stock this whole past year. Yeah, we've had some breaks over and above it, but for the most part, it is a big level, right? So at this point in time, we're just riding the 12 EMA. Amazon bulls are curling up here, trying to go for the daily trend breakout and also trying to go for the weekly trend breakout as well. Weekly higher lows are set right down here at about the 180 mark. And now we're just looking for that weekly trend expansion into the all time high area of resistance. But Amazon, similar to a lot of other big tech names, has their earnings next Thursday. So not that much price action before. One thing is for sure though, if we get rejected and fall over the next few days and revisit the lower 180s, I will be looking to make some aggressive short puts in this area and possibly even open a leap contract even prior to earnings because if earnings ends up bad for the company, I'm just gonna open up another leap contract down here and just DCA. I love this company. The valuation is fairly good even at 190 right now. And I think Amazon's gonna have a great rest of the year and a blowout 2025 as well, especially with the way they're ramping their AWS business very nicely. So that's how I'm looking at Amazon for now. Moving into Google, Google up about 0.62%, still doing a whole lot of nothing. Usually when we have these tight ranges of accumulation, guys, when they break, they tend to break hard. Now, obviously it's very difficult for me to derive if they're gonna break to the upside or to the downside. That's gonna be market dependent and also earnings dependent. They have their earnings next Tuesday. So possibly just consolidating right now prior to earnings in this range between the 169 and roughly the 162.50. I would get a little bit nervous here on the longer timeframes if we break down below this 162 range. If you do that, unfortunately, guys, we're in for a little bit further weekly consolidation, but it's looking good on the higher timeframes, right? The weekly really paints the best picture for Google. Weekly downtrend, nice weekly engulfing move, still looking for the weekly higher low for possible trend reversal to the bulls. So in the event we drop down here, guys, 160, I'll be looking to write some short puts with a little bit of time on them. And also if after earnings, we drop significantly, 
down into the maybe mid 150 range, kind of like we had back here, right? Google had great earnings last quarter, but the market just wasn't having it. Market was in a period of steep decline and all big tech, earning, big tech earnings were good, but we're just being sold off by the market. If this time is similar and we do get another opportunity for Google, I will be adding another leap contract or maybe even two down in this lower location. So that's how I'm looking to play Google for the week looking for the 160 short puts if we get an opening for tomorrow uh, or, you know, after earnings, looking for the leap contracts down there. Moving on to Meta, give me another brief second. So moving on to Meta, Meta not looking too bad today, 1.19% of the upside. We know Meta has been kind of trapped in this daily downtrend, which was also the resulting weekly consolidation, right? Beautiful weekly uptrend on Meta, just looking for the weekly higher low, guys. Anything above 495, pretty much. Looking for the weekly higher low for further trend continuation. Now, one day's worth of bounce is not enough to undo the entire downtrend, right? We still need to confirm an engulfing move. As of now, the bounce is maybe 25% of this move. I mean, you could put the fib on it, but you can do it with your eyes as well, right? About 38%. So I was slightly off, but you guys get the drill, right? We can tell that it's not like a 60% retracement, 70 or 80% retracement, right? So as of now, decent size bounce, but the expectation is still just for the bears to set up the lower high into lower low and continue the daily downtrend. If that is the case, I'll remind you what we're looking for still, still just looking for healthy weekly consolidation. And if we come down here, because Meta also has their earnings next Wednesday. So in the event Meta's earnings are not well received, which I would be surprised, but it's always possible, such as the one back here, right? If they are not well received and we revisit the four, uh, the 540, 545, 530-ish region, that 15 point range, one of my favorite trades again, guys, the breakout retest for further trend continuation. You see it even better on the monthly, right? Look at this gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous monthly chart right here. Beautiful monthly uptrend right now. In the event we retest this lower location, I would be a buyer for Meta stock down there. Now moving into Microsoft. Microsoft, really the leader of the day today in big tech, finally coming alive. So looking quite good today, right? 2.08% to the upside. And the daily MACD crossing. We were pointing at this MACD the last few days. Microsoft was kind of coiling up here a little bit, not willing to give back too much of the downside. We're playing good defense at this 200 daily moving average as well. And now we get the pop, get the pop back above our moving averages as well. The only problem is where did we pop into? Well, we're currently in a big area of resistance, right? 435 down about 425, big area of resistance as well. So we'll see how Microsoft stock deals with it. But now at least what have they done? They've created the daily uptrend with a lot of space. At this point, any pullback, anything above 413.50, looking for the daily higher low for another attempt at breaking through this resistance. That is if they don't do it with the momentum continuation in one shot as they kind of did right here, right? So Microsoft, not looking too bad at all. And even on the weekly, if we close the weekly in a bullish fashion, we can say, well, the weekly higher lows are set because now we do have the daily uptrend back, which is confirmed. So the weekly higher lows are set and possibly looking for a little bit of weekly trend expansion on Microsoft because we know Microsoft has been one of those MAG7 names that has not done too much at all this year. This is early January. We have not moved. So it's trailing the market and it's uh, and a lot of its peers uh, right now. So I would not be surprised if it plays a little bit of catch up into November and December. And as I all remind you guys, we did open some nice super juicy leap contracts about last week on Microsoft. They're up fairly decently. I think I have them right here. As a matter of fact, we took some, uh, you can see 1016 about in the morning. Leap calls 360 strike June 2026, $98.45 each, which was about a 77 to 78 delta right there. Uh, we paid about $9,845 for them. They're up about a thousand, thousand two hundred bucks right now. So decent little entry guys. We're going to be riding those leaps until Microsoft all time highs. So it should be fairly juicy for myself and the Discord members. And at this point as well, we also have some call debit spreads. So Microsoft, I'll be looking to add only if after earnings, we get a deep decline here back into 405, 400 region. This is the massive support level. That's where I would consider to add. But for now, I'm happy with the positions that I've built up here so far. If we if we draw further, I'll add to them. But as of now, just kind of riding them and see how we deal with this area of resistance. Moving on to Netflix. Netflix pulling back. Well, I mean, they deserve it, right? Huge move on Friday and yesterday. So looking quite good. Netflix clear as day, right? Daily break higher. So at this point, the bulls are in full control. At this point, any pullback looking for a daily 
higher low for possible further trend continuation. No red flags on Netflix at all. Chart is very, very simple. Weekly trend, full bullish control. Monthly trend, full bullish control as well. So we're really just looking at the daily, right? If they take back too much of this move, you open the door for a lower high into lower low. And at that point, what are we looking for, guys? Simply just looking for a weekly higher low for possible further trend continuation. I would target 730 down about 710. Area of nice confluence for a little bit of a pullback in the event the stock needs it before a further leg higher. Not looking too bad there. Moving on to NVIDIA. So NVIDIA also not looking too bad at all today, right? Bit of a sideways day for NVIDIA, down about 0.08%. Negligible for NVIDIA, right? What are we in? Daily uptrend is really, really nice right now. Higher lows are set. This is a brand new leg of daily uptrend. No red flags in sight. The bulls still have not lost the hourly uptrend. We're putting in a bunch of double and triple lows right now. But until you see a significant loss of the hourly uptrend and a loss of the 12 EMA, it's tough to say that the bulls are in jeopardy of losing this momentum right now. And when they do lose it, we have a lot of space, guys. Anything above 128.50, looking for a daily higher low for possible further trend continuation. And in the event they roll everything over, daily downtrend, well, you guys know the drill, on the weekly, do we have enough space? Tons of space. Anything above 10150, guys, just looking for a weekly higher low for possible further trend continuation. And I would be targeting on the pullback, you guys know it best, right? Breakout, retest, and possibly run. 130, 126 is the horizontal support. Also, the weekly 12 EMA is sitting right there. So this should be a good area for the bulls to defend. Now, moving on to Tesla. Well, Tesla, guys, it's going to be very tough, right? Because Tesla has earnings literally tomorrow after the close. The expected move at this point in time is about 6%. I do think that is a little bit low. I wouldn't be surprised if Tesla moves 8 to 10% in either direction. So it's going to be very tough to um, derive which way we should be doing this one, right? Because earnings are always a gamble, guys. Always, always, always a gamble. Delivery numbers came in in line or better with the expectations most recently, but it's going to be all about the growth of the energy business, their cost management as well, the free cash flow, and the net margins. Those numbers we do not have just yet. So if, if Tesla beats on all of them, we can possibly expect a nice little rally. And at that point, if they do beat here, guys, next area of resistance is going to be 235 to the upside. If they beat, they'll regain the daily uptrend, and we can maybe look at moving into a little bit further weekly trend recapture ever so slightly, right? But if they miss to the downside and go down the full extent of the expected move, 6% down, it's going to send us in the lower 200s. Now, we still have good support down here, guys. But, you know, a break of the 200 weekly EMA right here at about 201 down to 195. That is the last line of defense. 200 to 220 has been a very big level for the stock. Obviously, it's come lower. That's why there's a lower area of support at the 180. But 220, 200 is a very important level. The way that I'll be playing this, guys, I probably won't be playing it on the rally. Uh, because at that point, we'll be close to resistance, and I'd like to find a little bit more of a pullback after that to maybe go for the continuation. But in the event we'd have a drop, I will probably be looking, if we drop all the way, let's say, down about $200, I'll be looking to find some short puts here, guys, maybe in the 180s with a little bit of time on them, because I would not mind uh, being exposed to Tesla in the lower regions down here at about 180. So that's kind of how I'm going to look to play the stock. But of course, I'll cover earnings for you guys after the close tomorrow. And lastly, Palantir. So Palantir up about 0.56%, not looking too bad at all. Palantir doing just a whole lot of nothing, right? Just kind of sideways consolidation. Bulls are in full control right now. Beautiful daily uptrend. The daily higher lows are set with the lows right here, 40.33. So at this point, guys, if we break the highs, you guys know the drill. Daily trend expansion continues. We're gonna head to psychological numbers of resistance, 45 and then 50, of course. In the event we break to the downside and lose the daily uptrend, lose the daily 12 EMA, which has been a great guide so far. If we lose that, daily downtrend is underway. And you know the drill. What are we looking for? Who's in control here? The weekly bulls are in full, full, full control, right? At that point, you'd be looking for maybe a retest of a 39 to 38, which was, you know, decent resistance in the past for the markets in 2021. And also the confluence of the 12 EMA should be pulling into this area. I would not be surprised if this is the next area of reaction for the bulls. And if we do come down here, I would be tempted to maybe play some short puts for the wheel strategy, 36, 35, $34, depending how low we get. But weekly, uh, weekly um, RSI right now is a little bit overextended, right? So I'll be waiting for the pullback on Palantir. And once again, Palantir has earnings only in two weeks, Monday, the 4th of November. Uh, and that's gonna be pretty much it here, guys, in terms of today's price action. Um, in terms of the portfolio, well, unfortunately, it just logged me out. So let me just show it to you uh, in the Discord, right? So I'll show you the ones that we opened and the ones that we closed today. So one of them we, that we closed, we had the Chewies. You guys remember, right, remember the Chewies that I had yesterday? 
for 21 cents each. Well, happy to say, guys, we closed them for 50 plus percent profit in one single day. What did we do with that capital? We put it towards Elf Beauty at the 101 strike for about 60 cents, which is over our half a percent rule. I love that level on Elf. It was a top five options play uh, for that reason. So that's pretty much going to be at the lower end below the expected move. I really like the valuation for Elf down here. I know the chart's not looking the best, but decent amount of support down there, you know, 100 down about $90. So I want to start playing Elf a little bit, a little bit, a little bit more aggressively uh, in that whole um, area right there. So that's just a few of the trades uh, that we've made today. And in terms of the other one, I showed you guys the McDonald's trade. I think I did. And in terms of opening anything else, I don't think I opened anything else today. As a matter of fact, I did. I opened a uh, MO. I opened a call, a call for March, $45 strike, as you can see right here. $45 call, $5.70 each, right? Uh, so the, the moral of the story here, the way that I did the analysis is Philip Morris had great earnings this morning. Very, very nice earnings. Extremely bullish on the demand side for uh, Philip Morris, which is one of the uh, tobacco competitors, right, to MO, which is another tobacco play, essentially. But the reason that I like this one Philip Morris had their earnings. Altria has their earnings next week. But look at this chart, guys. This is one of my favorite setups. I've been talking about it the whole video so far. Breakout retest above all the monthly moving averages. This is a monthly chart. Breakout above all the moving averages looking for possible continuation. I mean, we're in calls, but still, I mean, if you're, even if you're in shares, right? This one pays an 8% dividend. The fundamentals for the business are looking quite good. Very, very, very steep profit margins, which, are, which is what I like to see. Solid free cash flow. EPS, consistent expansion, revenue, although the revenue isn't the best, not the best, I do still expect them to uh, have the capacity of increasing their share price just due to the sheer amount of EPS gains that they have and the amount of buybacks that they do as well. They do have the nice little uptrend here. So if you see some rotation to value again, I think this is a very decent play. It doesn't move as fast as NVIDIA, but I really like the technical setup on this one. And we'll be just be looking for the trend expansion, probably looking to take profits in the 55, possible 56 range. That's why I put about six months of time on the contract. So those are all the updated trades that I took today. So no real reason uh, for me to show you the portfolio. Uh, that's it. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. And if you did, consider dropping a like on the video. Would really appreciate it for the growth of the channel. Also consider subscribing to the channel if you're new. Would love to have you back. We do these every Monday through Friday after the close. And lastly, if you have any questions at all, please feel free, guys. Always leave them down below in the comments. Usually I answer them in the first 24 hours. Anything you want, if you want me to look at a specific stock, technical analysis, uh, an options play, anything you like, always feel free to leave it down below. And if you want access to all of these very nice trades, the wheel trades, the share trades, the call trades in real time, the McDonald's trades that we take in after hours sometimes, chat with me all day, the private live streams, the private videos, all my trade idea setups that I don't often uh, or that I don't always give to you guys on the channel as well. Well, the link is down below in the description for the Discord if you want to join there. And if not, well, I'll see you in a future video, guys. Take care. Always a pleasure. See you tomorrow after the close and peace.